So the, the ulama categorized this. This wasn't categorized by the Prophet ﷺ or the Sahaba. But ulama have categorized it. As with any knowledge, you categorize things. Right? Uh, so, so they divided them to, to minor signs and the major signs of the day. This course we're going to focus on the major signs, uh, not, uh, not the minor ones. The um, Dajjal, Imam Mahdi, Yajuj and Majuj, Isa alayhi salam coming back into this world to kill the Dajjal, the rising of the sun in the west, the beast and the smoke. Dajjal is uh, not mentioned directly in the Quran. But many Sahih Hadith, many Sahih Hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, multiple chains. Um, I've put a question mark, motivated by meaning, just because I'm being cautious here. Imam at tahawi Aqidah text, I'm sure most of you have studied, he mentions Dajjal as a point of Aqidah. And generally the scholar, I mean, he's not going to put something into Aqidah which is not motivated by meaning or motivated by because that's the whole point of Aqidah. Aqidah is something which we have to believe. Yeah? Now, is the Dajjal alluded to in the Quran? Uh, this Sheikh Imran is coming up with some very interesting recent analysis on this subject, which we're not going to go into uh, in this course, really. But um, he is coming up with some very interesting uh, thoughts on some ayahs of Quran. The coming back of Isa is something we believe that he will come. Once again, it's not directly, you know, it's not directly said in the way black and white that Prophet Isa will descend back down to earth in the Quran. But it's strongly um, implied by some ayahs of Quran and it is in the Sahih Hadith, many Sahih Hadith as well. Um, and once again, something that Imam at tahawi has included in the Aqidah. So, I sent around the, on the WhatsApp group, we, I sent the um, response of Sheikh Akram. I think it's a really good response he's written on this particular point. Um, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, once again, um, is a respected scholar. He's coming into a lot of criticism as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into that at the moment, but if you look at his response on this particular issue, do we believe that Isa is coming back? He's got a very good answer. Uh, so I encourage people to read that. That's something that we have certainty upon as a, a belief of uh, Sunni Muslims. And he also brings the eyes of Quran that it's quite, quite strong. You know, one eye of Quran says that there is about the people of the book, there is none of them but will believe in him before his death. There is none of them but will believe in him before his death. And so, so whose death? Yeah. Those who don't believe that Prophet Isa is going to come back or he's, you know, that he's already died, they'll say it means before the death of the Jew or the Christian. There is none of them that will believe in him before his death. But that can't be right. How can it be referring back to the Jew or Christian? Because lots of Jews and Christians die all the time. Lots of Jews die that don't believe in Jesus. So how can it mean that? So then it can only mean before his death, before the death of Isa alayhi salam. In other words, they will all believe in him when he comes back to this earth before he dies then they will finally believe. Now Yajuj and Majuj are directly mentioned in the Quran. Yeah? In Surah Al-Kahf, uh, there's a few ayahs at the end, towards the end of Surah Al-Kahf. And in Surah Al-Anbiya, there is one ayah. We'll come back to that obviously in the final class. Um, but yeah, so we've got to think, you know, the, 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 the things that are mentioned in the Quran are very important, of course. They must be the most important in my analysis, right? The beast is also mentioned directly in the Quran. In only one place in the Quran directly. Uh, 
and there's more information to be found in the hadith so the next class will be focused on the beast because obviously once again to be mentioned in the Quran it must be something very significant so then the smoke the smoke is mentioned in the Quran we're not going to devote a lot of time to the smoke because um, you know it's, it's not like those other things something a bit straight more straightforward so it's in Surah the Dukhan Dukhan is actually named after the smoke uh, then wait for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke covering the people this is a painful torment so according to the commentators they, they generally agree that this is not this is a sign before the day of judgment this is not actually on the day of judgment this will happen before the day of judgment uh, so obviously now we have the nuclear weapons we can speculate that this could be referring to a nuclear holocaust Allah knows best uh, you know about the mushroom clouds and how scientists have predicted if there ever is a nuclear war and uh, the sky will just be completely you know the, the whole okay another hadith famous hadith is known as the hadith of Thawban narrated by a sahabi called Thawban the Prophet ﷺ said to him O Thawban what you will you do when the nations call one another to invade you as people call one another to come and eat from one bowl Thawban said may my father and my mother be sacrificed for you a messenger of Allah is it because we are so few the Prophet ﷺ said no on that day you will be many but Allah will put weakness in your hearts Wahan. the people said what is that weakness O messenger of Allah he said it is love of this world and dislike of fighting and in most riwayah actually is this dislike of death karahiyat al maut which is related because fighting often leads to uh, you know shahada so in other words you you will not want you will not be desirous of shahada and the afterlife like the first generations abu huraira said the prophet said there are two types among the people of hell whom i have not yet seen you know these are two types of people that will come the first are people who have whips like the tails of oxen with which they beat people you see these um, you know the police the police states that we live in they, they carry these uh, you know batons and the second are women who are naked in spite of being dressed they will be led they will be led astray and will lead others astray and their heads will look like camel's humps these women will not enter paradise they will not even experience the faintest scent of it even though the fragrance of paradise can be perceived from such a great distance so these are all examples of what they call the lesser signs or the the minor signs other minor signs and like I said we're not going to focus on them in this course we're just going to mention them in the introduction here knowledge will be taken away from people miserliness will increase amongst the people trustworthy people will become very few and untrustworthy people will become the majority things like that you know many um, hadith now so we're going to go straight into Dajjal inshallah what is the meaning of Dajjal uh, in full we call Al-Masih Al-Masih Al-Dajjal yeah. so Masih is the Arabic for Messiah the Messiah was a prophet that was expected to come uh, amongst the Jews <coughs> yeah, foretold and he came his name was Isa alayhi salam yeah, he's known also as the Messiah al-Masih there's all sorts of discussion about the meaning of uh, Masih Messiah could be anointed so on um, and, and the Quran calls him Al-Masih, Al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam, the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam, alayhi salam. So that's one of his titles. So Al-Masih al-Dajjal is a, <coughs> an imposter Messiah. He's someone who pretends to be the Messiah. Dajjal means imposter pretender charlatan yeah. 
Now the Prophet ﷺ described Dajjal as a sharru fitnatin yuntadhar. This is actually the worst, the worst tribulation that will come, that is expected. The worst tribulation ever upon human beings. Um, so the Dajjal is a, is a very serious matter. Uh, so Muslim and Bukhari narrate. Now what I'm doing here, I'm going to, I'm going to whiz through these hadiths very quickly because what I want you to get an idea of here is <coughs> the most authentic hadith yeah, from Bukhari and Muslim, the most authentic hadith on Dajjal. What do they say? That's what I want you to focus on. And the, this is when we're talking about now intelligent analysis as well of hadith. Many hadith may be very strong. They may be in Bukhari Muslim, but they may have slight differences in the details. Yeah? That's fine because remember we said Sahabi are narrating by meaning. A lot of people of, of, uh, of a slightly um, who are not thinking they will start reading those hadith and say, oh, why does it say this and why does it say this a bit, why does it contradict this, why is this bit contradict? And they're just going to end up confused because they're not understanding. Yeah? Read it, this is by meaning. And look at what are the common threads, because then you're going to find out what is the thing we're sure about. If all these Sahaba are talking about Dajjal and they've said some different things, and maybe even something contradictory, but they all said something that was the same, the thing they said was the same, we know, is something we can be really sure about. And the things that they said was different, we, we can say, okay, that's, <coughs> we can take that. Interesting, but, especially if it was contradictory with another Sahabi, we can say, oh, we're not sure which one was right and which one's wrong. Or maybe there's some way to join the contradiction. So, Bukhari Muslim, Umar ibn Thabit says, the Prophet said, there will be written between his eyes the word kafir. Whoever, everyone who resents his bad deeds or every believer will be able to read it. He also said, you must know that no one of you will be able to see his Lord until he dies. In other words, if someone claims to be your Lord, you, you will never see your Lord. So don't get deceived by this thing. Because it will be a very strong deception. The Prophet said, Allah is not one-eyed, but the Dajjal is blind in his right eye, and his eye is like a floating grape. Muslim. Anas ibn Malik said, the Prophet said, there has never been a Prophet who did not warn his people against the one-eyed liar. Verily he is one-eyed, and your Lord is not one-eyed. On his forehead will be written the letters ka fa -ra. So here, not kafir, but actually Kaf, Fa, Ra, the letters. Right? So you can see little variations here, right? The Prophet said, I know more about the powers which the Dajjal will have than he will know himself. He will have two flowing rivers. One will appear to be pure water and the other will appear to be flaming fire. Whoever lives to see that, let him choose a river which seems to be fire. Then let him close his eyes, lower his head and drink from it, for it will be cold water. The Dajjal will be one-eyed. The place where one eye should be will be covered by a piece of skin. On his forehead will be written the word kafir. And every believer, whether literate or illiterate, will be able to read it. Muslim. Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet said, Shall I tell you something about the Dajjal which no Prophet has ever told his people before me? The Dajjal is one-eyed and will bring with him something which will resemble paradise and hell. But that which he calls paradise will in fact be hell. I warn you against him as Noah warned his people against him. So a few points here. First of all, that Asharu Fitnatin, this is the worst, worst tribulation. So every single prophet has warned his people about Dajjal. This is how bad Dajjal will be. Yeah, so not, not something to be taken lightly. And second, the Prophet gave a certain information that no other prophet had given before. So this must be a really, really crucial information. A really vital piece of information that he is one eyed. Right? Al Bukhari Muslim. 
Jabir ibn Abdullah swearing by Allah that Ibn Sayyad was the Dajjal. So this was uh, many hadith about Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Sayyad was a Jewish boy at the time of the Prophet and there were a lot of Sahaba that were convinced that he was Dajjal. Um, I'm going to skip over these hadith because uh, they're not relevant to our topic uh, at the moment. Um, ulama have debated them. Some said that the Sahaba didn't believe he was the main Dajjal but one of the lesser Dajjals because in some hadith it talks about other Dajjals that will come before the main Dajjal. Or it could be that they believed he was, they suspected he could be the main Dajjal, but it hadn't manifest and they were waiting for it to manifest from him. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, saw him, but from the hadith anyway, he didn't say he is the Dajjal. Yeah? But he was also looking to observe him in case he is Dajjal. So those are hadith that I'm not going to go into. And the reason I've mentioned it here is because just so that you're aware of them. And also um, some of them do have some information. Like it says, for example, the Prophet said the Jal would not enter Medina, so on and so forth. So this is Ibn Sayyad, he became Muslim. And he was saying to them, look, the Prophet said the Jal will never enter Medina, but I was born in Medina. Why do you think I'm Dajjal? So there was a whole whole thing that went on with Ibn Sayyad, yeah? The Prophet ﷺ said, The hour will not come until the following events have taken place. Two large groups will fight one another. And there will be many casualties. Think about the world wars. They will both be following the same religious teaching. Both Christians. Nearly 30 Dajjals will appear. Each of them falsely claiming to be a messenger from Allah. Knowledge will disappear. Earthquakes will increase. Time will pass quickly. Afflictions will appear and haraj, killing, will increase. Wealth will increase. In the 20th century, more people died in these wars than throughout human history joined together. Wealth will increase so that a wealthy man will worry lest no one accept his account. Look at the increase in wealth in this capitalist system, you know, this flooding of wealth uh, uh, everywhere. And when he offers it to anyone, that person will say, I'm not in need of it. People will compete in constructing high buildings. I mean, you live in a country here. If you want to give sadaqah or zakat, where you, you can't find anyone to give it to. Yeah? It's probably happened to some of you already. When a man passes by someone's grave, he will say, would that I were in his place. So people will wish they were dead, even though there's all this wealth and all of this affluence. People will be passing by graves and saying, I wish I was dead. Look at the levels of stress in this society. Look at the levels of suicidality. All surveys, every time they do surveys and uh, of, um, studies in levels of happiness and mental well-being, the more urbanized and wealthy, the, the un more unhappy the people are. It's a weird uh, situation. The sun will rise from the west. When it rises, the people will see it, they will believe. But no good will it do to a soul to believe in it then, if it did not believe before, nor earned righteousness. The hour will come suddenly when a man has milked his she-camel and taken away the milk, but he will not have time to drink it. Before a man repairing a tank for his livestock will be able to put water in it for his animals, and before a man who has raised a morsel of food to his mouth will be able to eat it. A Muslim. Another one about uh, Dajjal and the two flowing rivers. Um, one river will be fire, one will be like water. Dajjal will be one-eyed. Uh, so the reason why I've included all the narrations, because like I said, when Bukhari and Muslim are repeating narrations, they're bringing different chains. So showing you that this is not just a one chain. These are coming through many, many different chains of narration through many Sahaba and so on. That's why it's important to realize that. Uh, another one, he's one-eyed. So he will bring something that will resemble paradise and hell. But what he calls paradise will be hell. And what he calls hell will be paradise. 
So pick up here, you know, the common threads that are coming through all of these narrations. Um, okay, now we're going to go on to the hadith of Fatima bint Qais. So this is a very important hadith in our uh, study, which will come in relevance even in the following classes as well. Uh, so this hadith impacts upon Dajjal and the beast. Uh, and in some ways in uh, Yajuj and Majuj as well. So take some time to become familiar with this particular hadith. The interesting thing about this hadith, remember I said about the Sahih and memory. This is a hadith which is long. But at the end of this hadith you see, it's a very long hadith. But at the end of the hadith, what does Fatima bin Qais say? I memorized this from the Prophet I memorized this from the Prophet So, she, I mean, once again, she doesn't necessarily mean memorize verbatim. What, but she means is, I, I, I made an effort to remember this. You know, I made an effort when I heard this. I remember I made an effort to retain this and memorize it. So she wasn't sort of, you know, so this is imp this is important because this means that um, she's focused on this to, to, to remember it accurately. Obviously, don't forget in that oral culture, their memories were much better than ours in terms of memorizing things. Uh, and, and some people could memorize actually long uh, stretches of text or speech, you know, verbatim. Uh, but anyway, so this is an important hadith. Uh, it's in the books of Sahih. And basically in this hadith, but after the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ stands up and he says to them the following. So Fatima bint Qais is obviously in the women's row at the back of the congregation. The Prophet ﷺ sat on the mimbar, smiling and said, everyone should stay in his place. Do you know why I had asked you to assemble? So this must be something very important as well. This is not something the Prophet ﷺ has just told Fatima or one or two Sahaba. This is something is actually the whole congregation in Medina. And he said to them, stay, I want to tell you something after the prayer. So this is something important. It's not just uh, the norm. You know, many hadith are just from one person or two people, small, you know. This is something that he's actually telling all of them, you know. He's, he's asked them to assemble for this. <coughs> By Allah, I have not gathered you here to give you an exhortation or a warning. I have kept you here because Tamima Dari, a Christian man, who become Muslim has told me something that agrees with what you have what I have told you about Dajjal. <coughs> <coughs> and so this is known as the hadith of Tamim Dari. Tamim Dari is a man who became Muslim, he's Christian, and this is something that happened to him. And this is one of the very, I don't know if it's the only, maybe it's the only instance or one of very few that we know where the Prophet ﷺ is actually relating a hadith from someone else. <coughs> so this is the words of the Prophet ﷺ, not Tamim Adari. Tamim Adari has already told this to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ is now relating to the Muslims what Tamim Adari has told him. <coughs> he told me that he had sailed in a ship with 30 men from Banu Lacham and Banu Judham. There's some Christian Arab tribes in the north. The waves had tossed them about for a month. Then they were brought near to an island at the time of sunset. They landed on the island. They were met by a beast who was so hairy that they could not tell its front from its back. <coughs> They said, woe to you, what are you? He said, I am al-Jassasa. Jassasa from the Arabic root of spying, yeah, Jasus. 
They said, what, 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 is, what do you mean al jassas uh, They didn't understand, you know. It said, O oh, people, go to this man in the monastery, for he is very eager to know about you. Tamim said that when it named a person to us, we were afraid lest it be a devil. We went quickly to the monastery. There we found a huge man with his hands tied up to his neck. There we found a huge man with his hands tied up to his neck and iron shackles between his legs up to his ankles. We said, woe to you, who are you? He said, you will soon know about me, tell me who you are. We said, we are people from Arabia. We sailed in a ship, but the waves have been tossing us about for a month and they brought us to your island where we met a beast who was so hairy that we could not tell its front from its back. We said to it, Woe to you, who are you? He said, I am al Jassasa, uh, etc. Anyway, so then going on, he says, the, So the man who is chained up in the monastery says to them, Tell me about the date palms of Baisan. We said, What do you want to know about them? He said, I want to know whether their trees bear fruit or not. He said, We said, Yes. He said, Soon they will not bear fruit. Then he said, tell me about the lake of Tabaria. We said, what do you want to know about it? He said, is there water in it? He said, we said, there's plenty of water in it. He said, soon it will become dry. This is the lake Tiberias in, uh, in modern day Israel, also known as Sea of Galilee. Now it's been renamed to the biblical name Sea of Galilee. And it's drying up quite a lot right now. It's not, com not completely dry though yet. He said, tell me about the spring of Zuhar. We said, what do you want to know about it? He said, is there water in it and does it irrigate the land? We said, yes. Then he said, tell me about the unlettered prophet. What has he done? We said, he has left Mecca and settled in Yathrib. He asked, do the Arabs fight against him? We said, yes. He said, how does he deal with them? So we told him about the Prophet ﷺ had overcome the Arabs around him and that they had followed him. He said, has it really happened? We said, yes. He said, it is better for them if they follow him. Now I will tell you about myself. I am the Dajjal. I will soon be permitted to leave this place. I will emerge and travel about the earth. In 40 nights, I will pass through every town except Mecca and Medina. For these have been forbidden to me. Every time I try to enter either of them, I will be met by an angel bearing an unsheathed sword who will prevent me from entering. There will be angels guarding them at every passage leading to them. Fatima said, the Prophet some said, striking the pulpit with his staff, this is Tabor, this is Tabor. Have I not told you something like this? The people said yes. So the Prophet Sallallahu is relating this to them because it will also strengthen their Iman as well. That this is something the Prophet ﷺ has been telling them about Dajjal, uh, about Mecca and Medina, and how the angels will guard it from Dajjal. There's many hadith about that. Um, but then this Christian guy has had this experience and come and told them. So this is something amazing, you know, for the Muslims as well to strengthen their Iman. <coughs> he said, I like the account given to me by Tamim because it agrees with that which I have told you about the Dajjal and about Mecca and Medina. Indeed, he is in the Syrian Sea or the Yemen Sea. No, on the contrary, he is in the East, he is in the East, he is in the East. And he pointed towards the East. Fatima said, I memorize this from the Prophet ﷺ, Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, the Dajjal will appear at the end of time when religion is taken lightly. <coughs> we will, he will have 40 days in which to travel throughout the earth. So interesting, isn't it? When religion will be taken lightly. But at the same time, he will claim to be al Masih al Dajjal, and people will follow him, and he will claim to be God. Because these Christians, they believe Jesus is God anyway. Uh, so it seems like a paradox, but we're seeing that today in this world. We live in an age where atheism is, is dominating, but we have certain sectors where there's sort of religious fundamentalism. So there's religious fundamentalism and atheism at the same time. It's almost like uh, uh, trends in the same societies, yeah. 
Uh, he will leave, he will have 40 days in which to travel throughout the earth. One of these days will be like a year, another will be like a month, and one will be like a week, and the rest will be normal days. He will be riding a donkey. The width between his ears will be 40 cubits. Now, 40 cubits is about the size of an aeroplane's width, basically. He will say to the people, I am your Lord. He's one-eyed, but your Lord is not one-eyed. Uh, so, so we've come across these ones before, yeah? The written word kafir, cannot enter Mecca or Medina. He will have a mountain of bread. <coughs> when the people face hardship, except for those who follow him. Yeah, so we see this all the time now, right? Whoever doesn't follow Dajjal, they are put under <coughs> sanctions to the point of starvation. He will have two rivers. One will be paradise, one will be hell. The one that is paradise will be hell. Everything will be opposite. Everything will be opposite. Paradise will be hell with him, hell will be paradise. Allah will send with him devils who will speak to people. He will bring a great tribulation. He will issue a command to the sky and it will rain. It will seem to the people as if it is raining. Then he will appear to kill someone and bring him back to life. And so on. The people will say, can anyone do something like this except the Lord? Uh, the Muslims will flee to Jabal al dukhan in Syria. And the Dajjal will come and besiege them. The siege will intensify and they will suffer great hardship. Then Jesus, son of Mary, will descend and will call the people at dawn. O oh people, what prevented you from coming out to fight this evil liar? They will say he is a jinn. Then he will go out and find Jesus, son of Mary. The time for prayer will come and the Muslims will call on Jesus to lead the prayer. But he will say, let your Imam lead the prayer. So this is where some scholars have said is the Imam Mahdi. The Imam will lead them in the praying Salat al-Fajr and they will go out to fight the Dajjal. When the liar sees Jesus, he will dissolve like salt in water. Jesus will go and kill him and he will not let anyone who followed him live. Musnad Ahmad. And there's more, 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 more information as well. When Jesus sees Dajjal, Dajjal will have a thousand Jews, an army of a thousand Jews. Each one of them bearing a sword and a shield. When the Dajjal sees Jesus, he will begin to dissolve, etc. He will catch up with him at the eastern gate of Lud. This place is known, Lud, by the way, uh, from biblical sources, some, somewhere around near Israel. And he will kill him there. The Jews will be deflated with the help of Allah. There will be no place for them to hide. They will not be able to hide except behind any stone, uh, wall, animal or tree except the box thorn. Without it saying, O Muslim servant of Allah, here's a Jew, come and kill him. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, said the time of Dajjal will be 40 days, 40 years, actually 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one month, uh, one, one day like a week and then the rest of the days will pass so quickly. That if one of you were at the gates of Medina, he would reach, not reach the other gate before evening fell. So once again, the theme about time speeding up as well. Okay, so if, if we've looked at this in an intelligent fashion now, so we've narrated all the hadith from Bukhari and Muslim, the strongest. Um, you can see also, that there's not that many as well, in a way. You, you know, so remember Bukhari, Imam Bukhari has selected the hadith that are, are, are really, really solid. I mean, rock solid. Yeah, Bukhari, you know, honestly, the more you study about him and his methodology and the hadith that are in his book, you just feel more and more uh, confident and amazed. Yeah? So, so that's why I haven't bought hadith from other books uh, for our purposes today. I bought Muslim as well and Bukhari but just imagine from all the hadith he had that referred to Dajjal he picked these you know he picked these these are the solid rock solid ones so what have we seen in these hadith first of all the most important thing one eye it comes across in nearly all the hadith one eye one eye everyone keeps saying one eye right Kafara, Kafara is quite common. He will go to every city on the earth. In other words, he will have some sort of world government, world rule. Yeah? He will be a global 
phenomenon, not just a... And this is something new, you know, for the 19th century. Britain became the first global power that we know <coughs> of. We also know he's, he will be a Jew. He will be from Jewish descent. And there will be an army of Jews with him. He will travel in the sky like a cloud driven by a wind on a huge iron mule. So clearly air travel there uh, will be a sign of Dajjal. And air travel has only come about when? And, and the first aeroplane, just 1900s, yeah. the beginning of the 20th just century. Yeah, the, the, so air travel is a very recent phenomenon of the 20th century. A clear, clear indication that we're in Dajjalic times. Uh, human beings never imagined they could fly like that, you know. He, and then we have the 40 days, which is a recurring thing as well, yeah. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest like our days. It's obviously an aeroplane. If someone can't see that's an aeroplane, uh, you might as well just go home and bury your head in the sand. And, and even in some narrations it says it will have a cloud behind it. When it moves, yeah. and Dajjal will hop from one <coughs> city to the next. He will hop from one city to the next, flying between the clouds. I mean, that's airplanes without any shadow of a doubt. I can imagine, you know, people in the past being so confused about these hadiths, you know, and thinking, ah, oh, is this really, you know, what's going on here, you know? He'll be hopping from one city to the next in a massive iron mule. They must have been thinking, they must have tested their iman, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, for us it's just everyday thing now, but for them, they must... Um, going on to Ahmed Thompson, uh, one of our scholars, British, British convert. Um, partly, when, as we go through this course, it's also, the course is also <coughs> structured to take you through the same journey that I went through in learning about this science of Akhir zaman uh, in the same order as well, from Dajjal to the Beast to Yajuj and Majuj and so on. So, one of the earliest books I read was this one, Dajjal, The King Who Has No Clothes by Ahmed Thompson. Probably many people have come across that. Um, this is when I was about 17 or something. I mean, this was like a long time ago. Um, but we allow reward people, you know, these books have effects, you know. They, uh, in fact, I was speaking to uh, Sheikh Suleiman Vanayo recently, and uh, he said it's one of the first books he read when he became Muslim, as well, back a long time ago. Um, so people write books, you never know who they could impact, you know. Anyway, his, uh, he had a whole book about Dajjal. Sheikh Hamza also studied with the same, one of the same teachers of Ahmad Thompson, which is why they have a common thread. So their, their teacher was... Um, Sheikh Murabit, Murabit, what's okay, his name now? Abdul Qadir Murabit. <coughs> a Sufi, yeah. Who's, um, he's a convert as well. So they have this, you know, um, if you read his book, it's a little bit, um, it's quite, quite talks about Jews and Freemasons, yeah? And, and a secret conspiracy set up a one world government. Uh, Similar to the sort of beliefs that the Nazis had, and not just Nazis, but many people in Europe had uh, before the Second World War, about this secret Jewish conspiracy and, and, free, and working with Freemasons to set up a one world government, to take control of the, the world's government. And um, so he links this up to Dajjal. We know Dajjal will be a world leader. We know he'll be a Jew as well. Um, so perhaps this could be, you know, they're setting up this one world government and then Dajjal will be the leader who's been foretold in the Hadith. Um, and he says, you know, this Dajjal, he, he, the way he frames it is that he will be opposed by the Mahdi uh, and the Awliya, he, he puts it, you know, um, the people who are sort of fighting with the Mahdi. And... Um, Obviously, Prophet Isa Islam will be the final person who comes and then gets victory against the Dajjal. Um, so, as I said, many powerful people in Europe 
and America were convinced that Jewish elites were in a conspiracy with Freemasons. We're going to talk about Freemasons a bit later on, who they were. The Freemasons are a secretive uh, organization, primarily Anglo-Saxon, so uh, Britain, America, but they have lodges other places now as well, but it started off Anglo-Saxon. Um, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, we've talked about before as well in the history course. A secret book. <coughs> the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was a book that was published in the early 20th century. It was supposed to be a book with the secretive uh, recording of, minute, of meetings held by uh, supposedly the leaders of this uh, Jewish conspiracy. Uh, and it was found in Russia by some people and it was published and it, it caused a massive uh, publicity and controversy. And uh, obviously it was denied strongly by Jewish leaders and eventually it was supposedly debunked as a, as a, as a fiction. I'm not really interested in whether it was a genuine document or not, but what's more interesting for me is that how many people believed it was a true document. And these are people at the highest level of Western civilization, at the highest level of British, European, American government. Uh, the most, some of the most. So you have to think, wait a minute, these, these are the people who are in the highest echelons of power within that society. Yeah. So they obviously know how things work, what's going on behind the scenes, who are the people pulling the strings. And they, they become paranoid and convinced that there's some sort of secret Jewish conspiracy and Freemason conspiracy going on to take control of essentially the, the thing that they're already in control of. These are people like the Emperor, Emperor Wilhelm of Germany, right? He is the boss, he is the Emperor. <coughs> And he's paranoid that there's other people trying to take control of our society and civilization. And these people are very powerful, uh, financial, you know, banking, uh, um, Jewish families. But not just Jewish families, we have to stress that. They're also in liaison with the secretive Freemasons. But who are the Freemasons? We'll come back to that later. Um, they want to take control of the media and they want to take control of economies by taking control primarily of banking and money production. Yeah, um, so Henry Ford, you know, you've heard his name obviously because of the Ford, this was the beginning, he was, he was the first uh, industrial car manufacturer, the, one of the richest men in America, one of the most powerful men in America. He was funding, you know, half a million copies of the protocols to be printed and distributed because he was so convinced, you know, that this is revealing a secret conspiracy. The Nazis were um, printing these protocols. And then uh, in 1921, the Times ran uh, articles um, uh, supposedly exposing it to be fraudulent. <coughs> Uh, when Ford was challenged, you know, look, it's turned out to be a forgery, how do you feel? This is what he said. He said, look, the only statement I want to make is that the protocols, they fit in with what is going on. They are 16 years old and they have fitted the world situation to this time. In other words, what he's saying is, forget about if it's a forgery or not. What they are describing is what I have seen happening in America. In other words, these powerful Jewish groups and others taking control of the media, taking control of the money systems and trying to establish their own power. So he said, it doesn't matter if it's forgery or not, this is what's actually happening. Kaiser Wilhelm II, the Emperor of Germany, if not the most powerful, one of the two or three <coughs> most powerful people in Europe of his time, he said, and he's very closely related to the English, don't forget, he's a grandson of Queen Victoria. The English ruling classes were Freemasons. 
thoroughly infected by Judah, Jews in other words, Wilhelm asserted that the British people must be liberated from the Antichrist Judah. He was calling the Jews the Antichrist. We must drive the Jews out of England just as he has been chased out of the continent. He believed that Freemasons and Jews had caused the two world wars aiming at a world Jewish empire with British and American gold and that Judah's plan has been smashed to pieces. This is at the height of Nazi power. And they themselves swept out of the European continent. Continental Europe was now, he wrote, consolidating and closing itself off from the British influences after the elimination of the British and the Jews. The Jews are being thrust out of their nefarious positions in all countries, whom they have driven to hostility for centuries. So this whole idea that these Jewish elements have been responsible for many of the wars between European powers. Now, um, I don't know what to say. I mean, there may be some paranoia there as well because what happens is when you have a war between two European nations, and remember European nations are fighting all the time, the only people who are getting rich and richer are the people who have the money to lend to the governments and the kings to build, uh, because war is very expensive. So the countries end up bankrupted, but the financiers end up very richer than they were before. So from an outside perspective, it may seem like, wait a minute, who's benefiting from all these wars? Maybe they're actually causing them. You know, so we've got to be a little bit careful there. I've read, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, these wars, how they started, you know, historical uh, analysis of the First World War, the causes of the First World War, Second World War. I've never come across any, you know, like, uh, sort of conspiracy of financiers to start a war to actually benefit. But on the other hand, if it happened, it was very secretive. I wouldn't know. And maybe historians have not been able to uncover it. I don't know. Because remember, the one eye is the one big feature of those hadith that are in the strongest books. The one eye. And then we find this one eye on the dollar bill. Right? You're all familiar with that. So this one eye is, is actually, this is called the Great Seal of the United States of America. So, you know, this is really significant that this one key piece of knowledge, information, yeah, yeah, Dajjal is one eye, and America, this uh, this country that has you know taken over this global, that has got this global domination, by its own admission, we're not saying this. If you, you know, this is what we've done the geopolitics course for. They themselves describe it as the as a world order that America is responsible for, and America has created and maintains. So this world government which you know uh, is is uh, ultimately the one that has defeated the muslim muslims you know because britain was the one that defeated the muslims and america is just the western part of the british empire they just happen to have as their main symbol a one eye yeah now, the, the design for this one eye, the Great Seal, came from Sam Adams, who was, these guys were all Freemasons as well. Okay. And this one eye pyramid symbol is actually a Freemasonic symbol as well. So it, it was amongst the Freemasons before it became the symbol for the United States, the Great Seal of the United States of America. It was already a symbol within the Freemasons. It's one of their main symbols, in fact. So the eye is known as the eye of providence or the eye of God. Yeah, so the writing we're talking about here, you can see the writing here, Annuit Coptis and Novus Ordo Seclorum, New Order of the World. Yeah, and Annuit Coptis means he is pleased with our project. He is pleased with our project. Right? 
And what's the project? The project is Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages or the new order of the world. <coughs> In 82 resolution adopting the seal. Um, so yeah, this is when it was first became uh, on the dollar bill. No, this, this, uh, sorry, this was when it was first um, designed as a seal of the United States of America. <coughs> a pyramid unfinished, in the zenith an eye in a triangle, surrounded by a glory proper, is how it was described at the time. Um, so they have these three basic grades within the normal Freemason's Lodge. Apprentice, journeyman or fellow, now called fellow craft. Uh, uh, sorry, and master mason. Journeyman or fellow and master mason. These are the three basic degrees if you enter a Freemason's uh, Lodge. Um, but they have many <coughs> other degrees as well which are more secretive, um, which are uh, go up to number 33rd degree. Uh, but in these three ma ma basic degrees, if you're a Freemason, you're in the f local Freemason's Lodge. It's a uh, male-only club. Um, it's only by invite. And uh, you can go through these three stages by learning more and more about the Freemasons. Uh, you could say beliefs, in a way. The symbols that they have. And you, you're taught certain grips and certain signs yeah, that you have to do. So there's all this funny stuff about when you shake hands with a Freemason, they do funny things to your hands and things. And apparently they have to or something. Um, because at this low, the lowest level, these are just normal people that people know in, this, in their community. You know, so typically a very wealthy businessman or... Um, uh, you know, other other sort of uh, influential people, they'll be invited. A friend of mine um, who's a Muslim, he went to one of the top five schools in Britain and a private school. When he left, uh, after a couple of years, they sent him an invite to join the local Freemasons Lodge. So it's, it's, at that level, any you know, <coughs> people can join and it's not really like, uh, there's no conspiracy going on at that level. The interesting thing about Freemasons, you have to believe in a supreme being. You have to join the Freemasons, even at the lowest level, you have to profess a belief in a supreme being. Obviously a lot of them don't believe, you know, they're just regular people like um, one of my consultants when I worked in Hastings, he, he was a Freemason. Uh, he, he didn't believe in God or anything, but it's just part of the sort of rituals that you have to do when you join these Freemasons. You have to believe in a supreme being, or maybe he did, I don't know. Uh, so that's quite interesting, We're linking back up to Dajjal when he comes, how he'll claim to be God. Yeah. And it's not, they don't believe in the Christian God here, they just, you have to believe in a supreme being, a God. Uh, this is their symbol, some of their symbols, and this is what's known as the Masonic apron. This is probably, they consider to be the most important sort of uh, artifact, the apron. Uh, look at the sign on there, you know, the one eye. So it's quite scary, really, for us, when we've just going through all those hadith about the Jal will be one-eyed and so on. And... Um, People are telling us that these Freemasons secretively trying to take over the world and everything. Do we know when uh, they were started? Uh, yeah, I mean about 200 years ago, the sort of modern Freemasonry. Like I say, before that, they go back centuries, the stone, they were stonemasons. But they were like a guild of stonemasons. But about 200, 250 years ago, they opened their doors to non-masons. You didn't have to be a stonemason to actually join. And then it became like modern Freemasonry. You can trace back their history. There's books about their history. Uh, the mo like I said, the modern Freemasons, they're different from the old stonemasons. The stonemasons were like a guild, a professional guild, like you'd have a guild of doctors, guild of carpenters, tailors, so you have stonemasons. They were powerful because stonemasonry was very valued. Like you said, they, they used to build, there were people who could build, you know, big structures like castles and these things, churches. 
Um, so, but then at some point around about the 18th century, I believe, is when they opened the door to non-Masons. So in other words, anyone could become a Mason. So then it became more of like an exclusive club. The powerful in society were invited and it just became like a, 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 pl a meeting place for those who are the most powerful within the society. So that's how it started and it just grows from there. I mean, if you want to dig into the, the real details, you'll have to dig for yourself. Cause <laughs> many people have tried and failed because it is a secretive organization. And it's secretive according to themselves. Most of the information I'm giving you here is from their own websites, the Freemasons' websites. So they, they admit, they call themselves a secretive brotherhood, you know. So it's, it's a secretive, means secretive, doesn't it? Yeah. So this is, this is stuff that they've written on their own website. It is said to be more honourable than the Roman Eagle or the Golden Fleece. What is? The Masonic Apron. Yeah. The Masonic apron is literally the badge of a mason carried with him into next existence at the end of his life's pilgrimage. It is placed in the mortal remains and buried with his body in the grave. Um, so this is the eye that is on the apron and the eye that is on the seal of the United States. This is a Masonic eye, <coughs> the all-seeing Masonic eye of providence, an important symbol of the supreme being borrowed by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity. I mean, you can see the rays coming out of the eye as well. And uh, I mean, I heard this from Sheikh Hamza, but I've never actually traced the hadith myself. That in some reports it says that the, the one eye of Dajjal will have rays coming out of it. So, Allah Alam, I haven't seen that in print myself, but I did hear that from him. Other, interestingly, they have the, uh, the Solomon's Temple. So this is very strong within the Freemasons, the sim symbol of King Solomon's temple. Um, obviously they relate it back to their stonemason history, one of the greatest architectural structures built in ancient times. But for us obviously that's ominous as well because of the Dajjal connection to Jerusalem and so on. Um, Almost a third of U.S. presidents have been Freemasons. A lot of people don't know that. And the more recent ones we don't know because, you know, you only find out when you start looking historically when the information comes out. You only know if they're Freemasons <coughs> if, you, if they tell you, you know. Um, the Masons themselves actually trace their history back to King Solomon's temple. So King Sol Solomon's temple, which is uh, obviously on the, on the Dome of the Rock, is actually very central to their whole uh, beliefs system. So these are just a list of the US presidents that have been confirmed to have been Freemasons. You can see famous names there, you know, some of the founding fathers, George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Roosevelt, you know, a lot of them. Um, a lot of the founding fathers of America were Freemasons. Uh, some of them are listed here at the bottom. There's a picture of George Washington wearing his Masonic apron. Bit of a silly symbol really, isn't it? Masonic apron, but... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but for us, once again, very ominous really. You know, this is America, the most powerful country that has uh, dominated the world and their, their main symbol is this one eye. Um, British royal family, European royal families are part of Freemasons. Don't forget it is a secret society so we don't know everything uh, otherwise it wouldn't be a secret society. It's often dubbed as one of the world's most secret societies. Covert handshakes blah blah blah. A lot of connections to the British royal family. <coughs> um, hey, you know, one of the interesting point now, if you look up Freemasonry, you'll find a lot of information, official information from the Freemasons themselves. Uh, 20 years ago, there was a lot of conspiracy stuff 
So they've caught on and they've countered it really in a massive way. So when you do your Google searches now, their own stuff will come up first. So you'll hear their side of it before you go on to the more conspiracy, anti-Freemason stuff. So how did they manage to do this, you know? Um, how did they manage to get their websites appearing right at the top? Obviously they've put in some invest, they've put in some thought and investment and uh, so on. That's it. <laughs> So not, you know, at this lowest level of Freemasons, they're not all in, they don't all know about this conspiracy, if there is a conspiracy, let's say, to take, uh, you know, to take over world government. These are obviously, these guys are not involved in that. These are just the regular Freemasons. They do charitable dinners and uh, they have their little exclusive club, you know, they sort of, you pat my back, I'll pat your back type people. So... Going back to world government, <coughs> we've established from hadith and so on that Dajjal will travel to every city in the world, so he'll be a world ruler. Um, at the end of the by the end of the 19th century, for the first time, we see uh, one empire, the British Empire, uh, or in, in co any, if you combine them with the other European empires, France and Russia, uh, taking over a global um, rule. And this iconic picture that I've shown many times, you know, how they've just carving up the globe between them. Uh, this is just that hadith of Tauban again, we've already been through that, you know, about how the other nations, <coughs> the nations will invite themselves against you. Um, so, in the 20th century, the power of ruling the world goes over to the US. Now don't forget the US is just the Western British Empire which split up from the uh, London uh, and the Eastern British Empire collapsed after World War Two, you know, over, over a couple of decades but the Western British Empire, the United States, remains uh, and, it's, and since the collapse of USSR it's the only remaining superpower, the only remaining empire uh, New World Order uh, these, once again, these are terms not coined by us, but by them themselves, yeah, Novus Ordo Seclorum, uh, specifically New World Order, George Bush Sr., there's the uh, clip from his speech in 1991, just as the Soviet Union was collapsing and America was uh, bombing Iraq uh, with this coalition of powers supporting America. This is an historic moment. We have in this past year made great progress in ending the long era of conflict and Cold War. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. This is collective action, people working together at their best. I think a new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. Uh, there's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of, th of the world. No, I think this would be the time, because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, um, uh, world order financial world order, uh, they are kind of reluctant. So it, does, it certainly does seem like there's some sort of uh, thread through generations, you know, working towards some sort of world order. Uh, remember that sort of slightly ominous sentence from Kissinger's book about multi-generational, he just puts it in there, multi-generational effort towards, the, what does he mean by multi-generational? I mean, this has been going on for several generations. We've been working towards this world order. Very, very strange and ominous um, thing to say, really, if you think about it. Okay, so we have all of these institutions of world government that have been set up since World War II ended by the US. I mean, these are sort of institutions that sovereign 
nations would have, you know, but you have got world institutions now. Um, now, going on to the idea of the Messiah, we know that the Jews are waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah already came. His name was Isa ibn Maryam. The Jews rejected him, so they're still waiting for the Messiah. The Christians believed in him, and they're waiting for the Messiah to come back. The Muslims believed in him, and the Muslims are waiting for the Messiah to come back. Dajjal, when he comes, will claim to be the Messiah. So there's a potential for Jews to believe in him, because they're still waiting for the Messiah, the first one. There's a potential for Christians to believe in him, because they're waiting for the Messiah to come back. And there's a potential for Muslims to believe in him, because Muslims are also waiting for the Messiah to come back. He will claim divinity, which is something that the Christians already uh, give to him anyway. And they, they believe that Jesus was divine. Christians in the USA, particularly born-again Christians, or what are known as evangelical or born-again Christians, uh, are something that we want to focus on here because they have a strange they have some strange ideas within their Christian beliefs which lead us to conclude that they may well be the group that will take Dajjal as their leader when he comes they are the fastest growing religion worldwide by conversions Islam is the fastest growing religion worldwide by birth right. so sadly <laughs> they're doing better dawah they're putting more effort into dawah than we are we're just relying on <laughs> multiplication by having lots of kids at the moment they're converting actual christians and they're also converting a lot of non-christians mm. oh yeah you've got a lot of countries in africa uh, now even in Korea, there's a massive Christian evangelical movement. The Far East, you know, there's a, there's, it's, it's, it's very, very big. Um, so they, they're spreading around the world, but within America itself, there's, you know, obviously there are data, because they have like census like we do. So there's maybe between 30 to 60 million. These are numbers I had from a few, about 10 years back, but, you know, just talking averagely that are not Christian but born again. Remember we're focusing now on the born again or what we could call, call evangelical. It's difficult to give labels because like Muslims, uh, Christians are even more so. They have very fragmented, all sorts of different sects and different things. Um, so we're trying to just get some umbrella terms that cover quite a lot of different <coughs> sects. Um, so, so there will always be fuzziness around the borders, but uh, just for our purposes this is fine. Um, they're the most powerful political lobby in America. <coughs> Zionist Christians. These, so these evangelical born agains, they're Zionist Christians. Other Christians are not Zionist, like Catholics, for example, or even uh, some other Protestant groups. They're not Zionist. But these evangelicals, most of them, they are Zionist Christians. They've got certain specific beliefs about Zionism, about the Jews going back to Jerusalem, which are very interesting. So this doctrine that they hold is called dispensationalism. <coughs> uh, dispensationalism is a doctrine that was introduced into this evangelical Christianity only about 150 years ago. And somehow it has come about, you know, people can obviously look into where did this, how did this creep in? Where did it come from? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that for now because um, that's another issue. But the fact is that this belief came into Christianity in America that the Jews are still the chosen people. Remember, the Jews were the chosen people. That's what Christians used to believe. That's what Muslims believe as well. The Jews were the chosen people. But when they rejected Isa al Islam and then they rejected Muhammad, Sallam, they're no longer the chosen people. And Christians throughout the centuries believe that the Jews are no longer the chosen people. 
since they tried to kill, or according to them actually killed, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, in fact, that's why Jews were persecuted throughout the Middle Ages in uh, Europe. But somehow, in this particular Christianity, they suddenly started saying, actually the Jews are still the chosen people. The Jews must rebuild the Temple of Solomon. The Temple of Solomon has to be built on the Haram, because to them it's Haram as well. Today the Golden Dome, Dome of the Rock, that was built by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, is there. So they cannot rebuild the Temple of Solomon, Sulaiman salam, because we've got a massive masjid there. But according to this Christian evangelical doctrine, the second coming of Jesus cannot take place until the temple is rebuilt by the Jews and after the Jews return to the Holy Land. Interestingly, the Jews themselves believe that the Temple of Solomon must be rebuilt for the Messiah to come. So both these Zionist Christians and Zionist Jews believe that they need to rebuild the Temple of Sulaiman. I think I would say then the Dajjal will arrive because the one they take to be the Messiah will be Dajjal. Please remember that. <laughs> I don't want you to be following this guy when he comes. Not really from an Islamic perspective, but more from a... It's just interesting for us now, with the knowledge that we have, to see that this is what they believe. So you can see these sort of pieces fitting into place. You know, that all of these people, they believe that they'll, they need to rebuild this temple and then the Messiah will come. So we can conclude from that, that it will be Dajjal. They will believe he's the Messiah, but it will be an imposter. And, and all true Muslims will recognize him for an imposter. But some Muslims may also fall into, that's why I said be really careful, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> and these evangelical Christians further believe that when Jesus does come, there will be a massive war called Armageddon. And... You know, the scary, the scary thing is they believe that Jesus will make the first strike. So it's not going to be a defensive war. Jesus will strike at the infidels. And uh, fortunately, all true Christians will be saved from Armageddon by the rapture. They'll be all raised into heaven uh, while the earth is destroyed. So they, they believe, you know, a lot of Jews will become Christian when he comes. But those that don't will be killed like all the other infidels. So, so they believe a lot of them will become Christian. So, so Catholics and sort of mainstream Protestants don't, what are called ma mainstream. But these evangelicals are so big now that you, they're, they're really becoming the mainstream in some ways. Um, you can look into that. I mean, one of the main ways it, got, it became popularized by a guy called Schofield. It's here actually, Schofield's Bible, Schofield Reference Bible. This is the best-selling Bible with commentary in the world. Um, and he, you know, has this dispensationalism in there. Where did he get it from? Um, you, can, you can look into that. I mean, I have looked into it a little bit, but, I, you know, I can't really... Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, they, they, will base it, they will base it on interpretations of the New Testament. All of their beliefs, they will try to, you know, try to base it on their interpretations. But these interpretations are totally new. Oh, so this is the guy probably that introduced it, James Inglis, um, through this monthly magazine, Waymarks in the Wilderness. So you can look into who, who is this guy, where did he come from, did he have any not close Jewish friends, was he a free, I don't know, I, don't, I haven't looked into his thing, but... Um, does certainly seem very convenient for the Jews, for uh, Christians to start having these beliefs, you know. Uh, has become very popular in American evangelical churches, especially non-denominational Bible churches, etc. Um, but as we say, some Protestants and Catholics, they reject all of this uh, denominationalism. Israel has allied with U.S. evangelicals and dispensations to influence U.S. foreign policy. An obvious point. 
political commentator Kevin Phillips claimed in American Theocracy that dispensationalists and other fundamentalist Christians together with the oil lobby provided political assistance for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the following is from the Pew Research Center. Around 46% of Americans are Protestant and over 50% of those are Evangelicals. Right? So you could say about a quarter of all Americans are Evangelicals. Um, American Protestantism is best understood not as a single religious tradition but as three traditions, the Evangelical, the Mainline and the Black Protestant tradition. Uh, each of these traditions is made up of numerous denominations and congregations that share similar beliefs, practices and histories. So this gives you an idea of how you know, the, the structure works. Uh, so uh, amongst the Protestants you have three main uh, traditions, Evangelical, Mainline and Black Protestant. So it's the Evangelical one that we're talking about. Uh, so they still believe the Jews are still the chosen people of God. And when Jesus comes back, many of these Jews will believe in him. You know, the Israeli Jews. Washington Post. Half of evangelicals support Israel because they believe it is important for fulfilling end times prophecy. This was the headline. The tenet of Christian Zionism is that God's promise of the Holy Land to the Jews is eternal. It is not just something, in other words, it wasn't just for the past. The Jews have been promised the Holy Land till the end of time. Old Mixon said, when we talk about the Holy Land, God's promise of the Holy Land, we're talking about real estate on both sides of the Jordan River. So the sense of a greater Israel and expansionism is really important to this community. Jerusalem is just central to that. It's viewed as a historical and biblical capital. This is the other ominous thing is that the biblical Israel is much bigger than today's Israel. The biblical Israel covers Jordan, um, other areas into, and some say even all the way up to Medina in Arabia and so on. So these Christians, this is why they're always supporting, this is why the United States is always supporting Israel, even when they're doing these illegal settlements and things like that. Washington Post, still, you know, one of the leading American new newspapers. What kickstarts the end times into motion is Israel's political boundaries being re-established to what God promised the Israelites according to the Bible. This is not an uncommon view. The Lifeway poll found that 80% of evangelicals believed that the creation of Israel in 1948 was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and would bring about Christ's return. At this point, Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is the only concrete thing that his evangelical supporters can point to as part of fulfilling biblical prophecy to bring about the second coming of Christ. This is why Trump done that, you know, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of uh, Israel because he knew he'd have the support of all these evangelicals in America um, so going on to the one eye again some of the most powerful institutions in, in, in terms of power within the western societies we know are the media uh, and there's a Manuel Castells a sociologist who, who writes about the, med uh, the power of the media and considers the media to be the most powerful uh, institution within the Western societies. So if you look at these big media organizations, you can see their, their uh, logos, you know, very ominous, uh, very similar to the pyramid with the one eye. Uh, ABC News, the eye, you can see the eye there. Fox, can you see that pyramid with the eye? With the eye in the middle. Is it all just coincidence? Uh, CBS News, one eye, BBC News. Is there an eye there or am I just getting paranoid now? <laughs> I think I'm getting paranoid now. Yeah. 
<laughs> and now I'm getting really paranoid, huh? <laughs> Any fans of, G of uh, Al Jazeera? <laughs> yeah, I need to do that. I, I don't know why that just happened. Uh, the pro uh, uh, Sheikh Hamza mentioned a hadith where the army of Dajjal will have blue helmets. A very unusual color for traditionally, you know, the, for, for something to be colored blue. Especially helmets. But we have the United Nations. That, that's actually the color of their helmets. Is blue. Um, most of the followers of Dajjal will be Aulada Zina. Born out of wedlock, according to Sheikh Hamza. This is talking about 15 years back now. He said <coughs> the rate of uh, children born out of wedlock has now just for the first time gone over 50% in the United States of America. So all sorts of uh, things. Kafara, the Council of Foreign Relations, the most influential foreign policy think tank, think tank in USA. These are the people who advise the presidents and, the, and, and basically keep the long-term foreign policy of the USA. Just another coincidence once again, like the one eye everywhere. Uh, my head shake comes, uh, um, you know, saying this in a talk about Council of Foreign Relations, Kafara, and everyone laughed. Um, but he looked very annoyed, you know, because he was being very serious. <laughs> And people thought it was just like, you know, oh yeah, funny, yeah, council for Um For people who see, you can see, you know. And this is exactly what's happened. And if you look at the Americans, this is a very interesting article in Foreign Policy, which is an important magazine put out by an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations, which is really the intellectual, uh, it's the intellectual center of the American uh, nervous system. Really, it's the brain behind policies. They create policy papers. Samuel Huntington, in fact, the first, uh, the Cold War paper by Mr. X was first published in Foreign Policy. Now, it's interesting that Foreign Policy, that it's put out by Council on Foreign Relation, and they always use the acronym CFR. The C is for Council, so it has a K sound. The, the, the F is for foreign, so it has a F sound. And the uh, relations is for relations, ra, and it has a ra sound. And that gives you ka, fa, ra. Right? It's a very, I think it's not insignificant, right? Ka, That's fa, pretty profound, I mean, ka, fa, ra, <coughs> because don't forget in, in Arabic you don't have C. Council is ka. Uh, and, and the other point that Sheikh Hamza made was this very unusual. In Arabic, you don't have uh, acronyms. Are they called acronyms where you shorten it to the letters? You don't do that in Arabic. For, it's, ne it's never been done in Arabic, you know? Like uh, in English, you do it all the time. Like Karima is you K I S or whatever. You know, you, we do that all the time. But um, in, in Arabic, you don't do that at all, ever. You never do that. You never find just the letters of Arabic for, to make an acronym. So it's very, very unusual that the Prophet said ka fa ra as three separate letters. You see what I mean? <coughs> so, once again, if you want to believe that's all just another coincidence, that's fair enough. Um, I'm not going to say anything. Um, recently, there was a big uh, controversy because Hillary Clinton, at that time, she was Secretary of State. She inadvertently blurted out that she takes all her instructions from Council of Foreign Relations. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City, uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the Council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. I mean, so how can we look at all of this, what we're we making from all of this, and what can we predict may happen in the future uh, from all of this 
information and knowledge. Um, as I said, I mean, from things like the aeroplane and uh, sort of things he'll be able to do, it seems that we are already in the time of Dajjal. So we can only say that he, the individual who will be Dajjal, it must be imminent. But don't forget, time with Allah is different to time with us. So when we say imminent, we can't really say, uh, we can't put a time limit on it. Um, but what we can see is definitely in the 20th century, we have got air travel for the first time. Um, we've seen the first time a world government in place whose symbol is the one eye. So we can uh, say that then, once this uh, government is further established, the leader of this uh, one world government will be the Messiah, the false Messiah, Dajjal. The Jews are waiting for him, evangelical Christians are waiting for him. <coughs> And the Freemasons who are in this mix also believe in this supreme architect. The Hadith talk about Dajjal will be Jewish and led by an army of Jews. Well, the United States, the United Nations is the world government that will at the moment is headed by America. It was created by America as a tool of US power and, you, and America is without doubt the controlling power within the UN. But the UN is a structure, the world government structure. So um, that is the actual, you know, the structure of the world government. Uh, now here we come on to now Sheikh Imran's theory of the three stages of Dajjal which is a very interesting uh, hypothesis. And this is where Sheikh Imran has brought some ideas that are quite unique and new and original. Yeah, completely original. So we have to assess them according to the strength of their evidence. So he said, you know, the, when it talks about Dajjal will stay on the earth for 40 days, one day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest of the days like our days. What does that mean? So he's saying these first three days will be different dimensions of time, or what we would call space-time. Uh, the one day like a year, the one day like a month, the one day like a week. And then the rest of the days will be in our time dimension. In our time dimension. Now this may sound like uh, Star Wars or Star Trek to you, right? What's going on? Why is Sheikh Imran talking about time dimension, different dimensions of time, space and so on? But the, the fascinating thing is that you, we have got evidence for that <coughs> in the Quran itself. Yeah, there's evidence for this in the Quran itself. And for me, this was really uh, uh, an eye-opener, you know, when I first came across this, this uh, argument in Sheikh Imran's book, I was quite amazed. And a lot of things for me fitted into place. Because the Quran says, Verily a day with your Lord is as a thousand years of what you reckon. In Surah Al-Hajj. And in another surah, he says, he arranges every affair from the heavens to the earth. <coughs> then it will go up to him in one day, the space whereof is a thousand years of your reckoning. And then the other one you have, the angels and the book are sent to him in a day, the measure whereof is 50,000 years. 50,000 years. Now what's going on? In fact, this is one of those, if you, if, you've, if you come across these people who attack Islam and attack the Quran, they say, look, the Quran's got contradiction. The, in other words, the, the, the seven heavens are actually seven dimensions of time space. In each heaven, the, the, the movement of time is different. 
So we live within the first heaven. And the first heaven is the whole of this universe. Not just uh, the earth and the sky, but the whole of this universe is the first heaven. We know that because the Quran <coughs> says Allah ornamented the first heaven with stars. Okay, so the stars are, are throughout this whole universe. So the other heavens, uh, time moves in a different rate. Uh, and that totally makes sense because when the Prophet ﷺ went for the Miraj, remember he went through the heavens and when he came back, the, no time had passed. Sayyidina Aisha said the bed was still warm from when he had left. So no hardly time had passed, even though he's been through a massive long journey through seven heavens. So the time is passing very, very much slower in those as you go through the heavens. So there are some, like Allah says, the angels and the ruh can't go up to him. It's 50,000 years, only one day passes here with us. 50,000 years pass in that heaven. And one day passes on the earth. You see what I mean? This Einstein's relativity, time changes, you know. So if you're traveling closer to the speed of light, time slows down. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's interesting that science has actually <coughs> allowed for this in a way, if you, if you think, or if you know what I mean. Um, although we don't need science to allow it for us. Um, so to me this makes total sense and I'll tell you why, there's further proof here in the Quran. Um, <coughs> it's what you were saying, you know, go to the classical always as well. Just to see what did they say about these, you know, time, I mean the heavens and things like that. That's true, that's just a bit smaller. Um, six days, so this is one of the tafsir uh, from Ibn Abbas, that the day of a thousand years is one of the six days in which Allah creates the heaven and the earth. The day of a thousand years mentioned in Surah al Sajda is the length of time it takes from, uh, for a matter to go up to Allah. And the day of 50,000 years is the day of resurrection. So they reckon that they didn't say, um, you know. So they recognize that days can have different lengths, you know, fifty thousand or one thousand. We're trying to balance how it works. The second is what is meant by all of them is day of resurrection. The difference is the time span depends on whether a person is a believer or a kafir. So if you're a believer, you will experience it differently. If you're a kafir, you will just experience it differently. This is indicated by the ayah. Truly the day uh, is a hard day, far from easy for disbelievers. These two suggestions were mentioned by the author of it, Khan and Allah knows best. So this was, you know, just like you were saying, at least I let's see, what did the... The reason why I brought that in is because I, I'm stressing very carefully that this <coughs> idea of the seven heavens being different dimensions of space-time is something new. Yeah. I haven't seen it in the classical tafsirs. Uh, why do I accept it? Is because for me it doesn't contradict anything within the classical tafsirs and it actually makes a lot of sense. It actually um, goes with the evidence from the Quran. Yeah. So they didn't, they didn't, there was nothing you know, in the classical tafsirs that I've seen uh, to indicate about these seven dimensions of space-time. Um, so that everyone should know that you know, this, is a, this is something new I think. Uh, but I tell you what made it really convincing to me is because I'd always had a mystery in my head about the seven earths. Because the, 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 the Quran doesn't mention just seven heavens, it mentions seven earths. And I never could understand what does that mean. And this actually then makes total sense. Cause, so this is the ayah, it's only mentioned in one ayah, the seven earths. The seven heavens are mentioned in many places in the Quran. Yeah? But in this one ayah, Allah says, it is Allah who has created the seven heavens and of the earth, the like thereof, in brackets, i.e. seven. So the Muslims have always believed there's seven earths <coughs> as well as seven heavens. If you look at the classical tafsirs, you know, they all believe, yeah, there's seven earths, but because that's, that's the only thing that ayah can really mean, that's far as we can tell. So what's being referred to here then? Is the Imam 
No, so what I'm saying is there are seven dimensions of time. Oh, I see. So the seven earths are not separate earths. Yes. It's here with us now. There are seven dimensions right here now. We're in one of them. But for example, the malaika are in a different one. The jinn are in a different one. And that's why we have no correlation. And, and, and why? Because we know jinn move very quickly. Now the jinn, remember the jinn that freed in the Quran? He said, I can get the agate for you before you can stand up. I'll go and get the arsh and come back before you can even stand up. Is that power so he can move rapidly. Or the seven heavens? The heavens and the earths, they're, they're the seven dimensions. Yeah, it's both linked. I think they're parallel, that's what I'm saying. So if you think about it, say for example the jinn are in a dimension where one day here is like a year for them. One day here, one year for them. They have a whole year. So by the time I stand up, they've probably got about 10 days. They can quickly go get the arsh, bring it back. You see the, you see how it works? So, there are a lot of things, you know, in the Quran that indicate that this could be definitely um, an explanation of the seven heavens and seven earths. So this is, uh, once again, to emphasize something probably new. Sheikh Imran has bought, there may have been previous, you know, obviously something for some people to research, you know. I only looked at a few of the classical tafsirs to see what was written about seven heaven, but I haven't looked at it in depth. So, so the basic the point is that there's time is passing different at each level. So this is where now we go back to the hadith of Dajjal. His, his, the first day will be like a year. The second day will be like a month. The third day will be like a week. And the rest of these days will be like your days. So then you will be with us in this dimension. Right? And that sort of then ties all of that together and makes some sense. So, while he is in the first day, the second day, the third day, we will not see him. Like we don't see the jinn and the malaika, they're in different, they're in different dimensions of time space. But he's there, he's doing things, you know, he's working his mischief. This is just showing what the, some of the classical commentators said about the seven earths. Yeah? That there are seven earths in layers, one above another. That's interesting, isn't it? What do they mean by layers? Because obviously it can't mean physically. We know that now. I mean, we, we know about geology and what's under the ground. Uh, they, can't, they can't physically be in layers. Uh, so this is then, yeah, so then Sheikh, uh, <coughs> Sheikh um, Imran, he says the day like a year was a time of the British Empire when, Brit when the British ruled the world. <coughs> the day like a month is the American Empire, which is the phase we're in now, when America is the world ruler. And then the day like a week was the one to come, which was when Israel would take over the role of America as the world leading superpower and then Dajjal will appear in our zone after the week takes place. <coughs> this is really interesting, I mean, you know, um, of course it's a theory, yeah, you take it for what it is, it's not a, he's not a prophet, he's not telling us this will happen. Unfortunately, some people do take it like that, and this is what leads to a lot of confusion. Uh, so, so some people follow their sheikhs like their prophets. You know, whatever they say must be hundred percent true. And he, even though he keeps him saying himself, this is just my own theory. So anyway, so the prediction is that the American uh, hegemony will give way to Israeli hegemony at some point. If we look at historically how this went from Britain to America, we can see it went through war. Right? One empire became exhausted through trying to maintain its uh, global hegemony by fighting massive wars and also the development of new technology 
uh, weapons technology is very important. So the atom bomb was a key technological development that gave America that new edge. So we can speculate from that that if Israel is able to bring forward some technological advancement in weaponry, which obviously we know they're, they're very in the forefront of developing these technologies and all sorts of things, then there's a possibility that this theory may be correct. The other ominous thing about this is, of course, for Israel to become a ruling uh, state, it would have to expand its territory massively, because Israel is a tiny country, you know. It's literally, you can walk across it in a couple of hours at the narrowest point. It's so tiny, you can't even see it on the most maps. So they would have to, uh, it's just a, a fact of, um, a practical fact, you know, you can't, you can't be a ruling uh, state without um, any size behind you. Uh, so he said for Israel to become the world superpower, if Sheikh Imran is correct, they would have to have an expansion of land territory, um, maybe development of a new super weapon. We know they're working on, obviously all governments are anyway, but uh, Israelis are particularly within the, um, you know, technology sector. Um, is there going to be a collapse of the US dollar so that the world's currency is then controlled uh, by a more centralized Jewish factors? Is there going to be a World War Three before this transition takes place? Because the transition from Britain to America took place after World War One and World War Two. For America, America to become so weakened that it give that it gives up its power to another <coughs> force, um, it would maybe have to suffer a war. There's a lot of distortion of time. Don't forget, as we come close to the end of time, time becomes very distorted. This thing about quickening of time and so on. So it's uh, it's it's uh, you know. It's very difficult to predict, to predict, I think, in terms of time, because time is uh, time is all over the place now.